Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. It is time for our monthly edition of What's New at Ancestry. This is for February 2018. If you've never joined us for a What's New episode before, we're going to briefly cover uh, some of the upcoming events in the genealogy world. Then we're going to talk about any changes or updates made to the website. And then we'll wrap up with a conclusion of um, new content that's come out on the site so far in the last month. So let's dive in with new uh, or upcoming genealogical events. There's just a whole list of stuff there on your screen, and I just want to cover a few of these things. Coming up very soon, the end of this month, it's um, the 28th of February through the 3rd of March, is the largest genealogical conference in the world. That would be Roots Tech. It will be held in Salt Lake City. And it is packed full. Um, there are so many great things that are planned for this. Great keynote speakers, a, an exhibit hall that's got a lot going on. Ancestry has a lot of stuff happening at this conference and event. And then, of course, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of classes. Um, classes that range for beginners all the way up through advanced and professional genealogists. Classes about technology, about methodology, about records, about research techniques. And then one of the best parts of any genealogical conference, of course, is the networking, where we get to meet with other genealogists, people who get why we do what we do, people that can help us uh, further our own research or tell our own family stories in a really meaningful way. So if you are interested in that event, you can go to rootstech.org. All of the details are there about how to register for that conference. Uh, and if you're coming in from out of town, there will be information there about the hotels that are available at a conference rate. Now, if you cannot make it in person to Roots Tech, go to rootstech.org. There is, there is information there about streaming classes. So you can sign up to watch uh, some of the events from home, including several of the keynote events. And um, I believe they're going to be having a class each hour that they'll be streaming throughout the entire week of Roots Tech. So go to rootstech.org. You'll be able to see the details there. <clears throat> now, the rest of the conferences listed there on the screen are the major genealogical conferences hosted by U.S. organizations. There are, of course, conferences uh, around the world, lots of options locally and regionally. Uh, go to conferencekeeper.org. You'll find everything arranged there by geography. You can see what events are happening locally. But the ones that are on your screen, those are the events that I'll be at this year. If you do come to one of these conferences, please be sure to find the Ancestry booth and come seek me out. I would love to meet you and hear all about your research. Okay, let's talk about uh, just a minor change on the website that some of you may have noticed. Now, I got some questions about this last week when I was showing my own screen, so I thought maybe it was time to address it. Now, all of you will not have this yet. Um, but some of you may have noticed a change to your homepage on Ancestry. So uh, on this account, I have this change. You'll notice it has a welcome message at the top. And then here on the left, I have the information to get directly to my tree. Now, this is going to be the last tree that I worked on on my account. I can still come up here to trees, get a complete list of all the trees in my account. But the last tree that I worked on will show up here and the last person that I worked on. So these are all clickable. I can go to any one of these people. I can go directly to my tree. I can go directly to my all hints list. I can start a search. So uh, all of these things on this card are clickable. Over here on the left, you're going to see a link to my DNA homepage. Again, all of these things are clickable. I can go to any one of these specific matches. I can go to my entire DNA match list with that giant green button there. I can view just my shared ancestor hints just my DNA circles, or I can go to my DNA story to view more about my ethnicity estimate and my origins. So all of that in, um, is the top cards on the homepage. Those are new. If you scroll down past that below the fold there, you're going to see the search box. You can click advanced search options. That will take you to um, the search page. I guess I have to do it this way. That will take me to the search page on Ancestry or I can just fill in this search here. We have a little widget here for our We Remember platform. And then below that, you're going to see um, some 
some menu items that have just been surfaced there at the top of the page. And then of course, as always at the bottom in the footer on the home page, you're gonna see links to the support center, links to the corporate blog. That's where we communicate with people, um, any major changes or updates um, or information. There's a link to site maps, gift memberships, careers. We are doing quite a bit of hiring right now. And then if you want to visit any of our other sites, you can do that through the link there on the bottom right. So that uh, is just a preview there of some of the changes that have been made to the homepage. Now, if you're brand new to Ancestry, this is the only homepage you know, so this is not a change for you. But for those of you who've been using Ancestry for a while, like I mentioned earlier, we are rolling this out to all users, so you may have seen it um, or you may not have seen it yet, but this is the direction that we're going. As always, we welcome feedback. So if you just come up here to the help link, click on the support center, and then type in feedback, you will get a link to share any feedback you have with us about any of the changes that we make, any of the content, any of the products and services that we offer. Um, you can do that there through this providing feedback about Ancestry link in the support center. Okay, that's the big change this month um, that, like I said, some of you will have seen, some of you may not have seen yet. Let's talk about content. So uh, there's some new content this month, and whether this specific content applies to you or not, um, maybe hang in there with me today because um, I selected each of these databases not because they have huge record counts, that's usually what I highlight is very large collections that we release during a given month. But I selected some very specific co content collections to highlight this month because of some unique things that you can learn about genealogical content in general from them. So let's start with the Montana birth records. If you're not familiar with how to find the new content on Ancestry, if you just click on search, scroll all the way down here to the card catalog, and then you sort that card catalog by date added. That'll put all the new content collections at the top of the list. You'll see here we have a new tag on there. We leave those on there for 90 days after we publish a collection. If you move your um, mouse over the, the link, don't actually click, just move the mouse over it, you'll get this little pop-up card that will tell you the date that Ancestry published the information and a little snippet of information about that particular database. So let's talk about these Montana records. There are about uh, 350,000 of them. As you can see here, they date from 1897 through 1919. Now, the reason I chose to highlight this particular set of records has to do with the date range. One of the questions that we get a lot at Ancestry is, how come I can't find my birth record or my parents' birth record? Well, one of the things that's important to understand is that here in the United States, every state decides upon their own privacy laws. So in some states, like California or North Carolina or Texas, birth records are considered public record. So we have birth records um, that are fairly current. However, some states have a 100-year privacy law on birth records. Oklahoma comes immediately to mind. And so you will not see birth records, current birth records, for that state because of their privacy laws. So in this case, Montana um, has provided us with records that date through 1919. So that's a 98-year um, limitation on this particular set of records. Now, as always, once you get to a database, like if I've got family from Montana and I want to start searching, it's really tempting just to start searching. But I always encourage people, scroll down past the search box you're gonna see the source information. So that will tell you where Ancestry obtained this information from. In this case, we got it from the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services in Helena. That's important because it will allow you to contact them to get additional information. Also, just because they do not allow us to publish those records online does not mean that they're not available. Very often, immediate family members can request certificates that are of a later date. 
So um, here you can see the, uh, then below that source information is the database description, which gives you information about what will be included on the record, and then sometimes uh, some additional information about contacting that original archive. So Montana birth records, uh, 300,000 or so of them have come online this month. And just a reminder that no matter where you're looking for those birth records, remember every state and every country controls their own privacy laws and Ancestry can only put online what they allow us access to. The next set of records I wanna highlight is the Idaho Old Penitentiary prison records from 1882 to 1961. You'll see those here toward the top of the list. There's about 25,000 of them in this particular database. Now, the reason I'm highlighting these records is because um, black sheep are the ones who often provide us with the most records. They're the ones who uh, got in the most trouble, had the most newspaper articles written about them, have things like prison records. And so uh, remember that when you're researching your family history, don't just research your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents. Always look for brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and grandchildren. Um, fill out the entire family. And the reason, one of the reasons why I do that, besides the fact that it tells me more about the family, right? No person in a family is an island. Um, it also is very often the case that a record from a sibling or a niece or nephew or a grandchild has the information that I need to be able to correctly identify the parents and the grandparents. And so you have these, these really rich records that include information about birth date and place and marriage date and place and spouse's name, as well as the details of their uh, crime and their uh, conviction and their incarceration. So, um, like I said, black sheep, they give us some really great records uh, and maybe sometimes provide us with some interesting stories to tell around the family dinner table. Okay, next up is the New Mexico Census Military and Other Records of Mexico from 1821 to 1846. So here is the reason why I wanted to highlight this particular set of records. Whether you are doing research here in the United States or whether you're doing research overseas anywhere or you know, north up in Canada or south down in Mexico, one of the important principles of genealogy is that you need to be familiar with the geopolitical condition of the place where you are researching. That's just a really lofty way of saying boundaries change over time. And so you need to understand that that's the case so that you know where to look for records. Now, in some cases, uh, the records will stay with the location when the boundaries change. And in some cases, the records will remain with the original jurisdiction. So, for example, I had someone ask me once at a conference, uh, if my grandfather lived in a place that, you know, used to be Poland and now is Germany or vice versa, um, do I need to look in Poland for records or do I need to look in Germany for records? And my answer to that question was, yes. <laughs> Um, you need to look in both places because you don't know where the records ended up. So I wanted to highlight this set of New Mexico records just to, to drive home the point that New Mexico has not always been a part of the United States. And so you will have sets of records, historical records, for families who lived in New Mexico that are entirely in Spanish. Um, and even though these particular records came from the New Mexico State Records Center and Archives in Santa Fe, they came from the Mexican archives of New Mexico. So within the, the New Mexico State Archive, they have a collection of Mexico records or records that were um, part of the Spanish Kingdom of New Mexico um, prior to New Mexico being part of uh, the United States. The other thing that's important to, to realize is that these records say New Mexico, but in, from 1821 to 1846, the Spanish Kingdom of New Mexico included what we now consider the state of Arizona. And so, again, it's important to understand that 
boundaries have changed over time, and that if your family lived in one of these places during that time period, sometimes you might have to look in multiple locations to find records about those people that lived there in that time and place. Now, the records in this particular collection are, are super rich. So censuses, I think most of you probably understand uh, or have a general idea about. Military records make sense, but then you see this other records category that's just a catch-all. That's a situation where reading the database description is gonna be really useful for you. Because what you'll learn here is that there are uh, records that are about provincial administration, treasury, legislative, local government, judicial cases, military, Indian affairs, and some period newspapers. Um, and then it talks about how lists in the Hacienda military and miscellaneous record groups have been indexed, but other record groups can be browsed by year and record group. So one of the things, again, that is important to understand, and I'll highlight this again in a minute in more detail, is that not all records on Ancestry are indexed, which means you will not necessarily find them by searching. However, you can browse. So I can come up here and I can say, well, I'm looking for family that was living um, in that territory in 1833, and then it will tell me what records are available. Now, in this, in this case, remember the database description says Hacienda Military and miscellaneous record groups have been indexed. Other record groups can be browsed by year and record group. So in this case, Hacienda records have been indexed, military records have been indexed, and miscellaneous records have been indexed, but the legislative, judicial proceedings, governor's papers, and commandant's principal papers have not been indexed. So I can click on that, I can go to that set of images, and just like I would browse a, or scroll through a reel of microfilm in a library, I can quickly skim through this record or I can go image by image to read what's included in these particular records. Now, the final thing I wanna highlight about this again, and I kind of mentioned it in passing, but I wanna make sure it's really clear is that these records are in Spanish um, because it was a Spanish territory at the time. Ancestry does not translate records. So we index them, which means we key the names as we can find them on a particular record, but we're not translating the entire record. Sometimes we will translate field headings if we have those available, uh, but you will need to have either a working knowledge of Spanish or uh, work with somebody who speaks Spanish or you can do what I do, which is I use Google Translate. I'll just type stuff in until I get a general idea of what the record's saying. And then if it's something that I feel like I need translated more closely or carefully, I will reach out to someone who can do that. That is a great thing to use genealogical societies for. A lot of them have um, people who can translate records. Uh, or there are some Facebook groups. If you just go to Facebook and do a search for Spain genealogy or Spanish genealogy, you might find a group that would allow you to post a link to a record so that it can be translated. Okay, a lot of stuff uh, covered there in those New Mexico records, but hopefully that becomes applicable to you. You can apply those same principles regardless of what record collection you are looking at. Now, another collection I want to highlight today is the Macomb County, Michigan Death Index. Now, you'll notice this goes through 2017. So again, uh, every state sets their privacy laws for their birth, marriage, and death records. In this case, Michigan does not have a privacy law. Um, well, they do, but it, it allows for death records to be made public record. Um, this is just an index, however. So that's important to understand is that there is not an actual copy of the death certificate. The purpose of an index is to give you just enough information that you can decide, is this my person or is this not my person? And then go to the, the originator to get a copy of the original record. Now, another thing to note about this particular set of records is this word web right here at the beginning. Anytime you see the word web on a database on Ancestry, it means Ancestry does not host that particular set of records on our website. It means that another organization or entity, in this case, you'll see over here this data is published by Macomb County, another entity holds those records, and we are just 
pointing an index to those records or making them searchable from within Ancestry so that, the, that you know they exist somewhere out there on the web. So anytime you see that word web, again, Ancestry is not hosting those records. We don't own those records. We are simply pointing an index to where those records are hosted. Okay, let's talk then about the Wiltshire, England wills and probate records. These date from 1530 to 1858. I love, love, love English records uh, because they do go back into the 15 and 1600s and because they've managed to preserve so very many of these records. In this case, this particular set of records, which was just published this past week, um, again, you're going to see here that they are uh, provided here by the History Center in Wiltshire, and then you'll see a detailed dis database description about these particular wills. So I would always encourage you, whenever it's the first time you've worked with a set of records, to make sure you read that database description so that you understand the records, so that you understand what you're looking at, so that you know if there's more you should be looking for. Um, most records in this case um, were not created for genealogical purposes. And so sometimes understanding the purpose for which they're created and the manner in which they're organized actually can provide you with more clues to help you understand a, is this really my person or not? And B, if this is my person, what additional information can I glean from this record? Or where else can I go to gain additional information? So you can see really detailed database description here with lots of information. Uh, at the very bottom of that, and we do this for some of our um, more complex record sets, you will see tips for using this collection. So it's just a quick list of bullet points that help you understand what you will and won't find or how best to search these records. Another point that I want to make is that in some of these cases, with some of these really old records, they're not all in English. So English is traditionally the language of England, but legal documents, um, some of them are in handwriting that was um, old handwriting, old style handwriting, and so you need to understand a little bit about how to uh, read those letters. So even though it's English, they, the letters weren't necessarily formed the way that we are um, used to them. So you'll see here that there is a link to a guide to reading old handwriting, and that becomes super important when you're looking at some of those 15, 16, 1700s records. Also, some of the older records were actually written in Latin or used Latin terms throughout the document. And so you'll see a glossary for Latin terms. Um, there's a link to the National Archives um, information there as well. So then we have also a link directly to the National Archives website where they have additional information so that you can understand these records. Lots of information there, and I understand that. And for those of you who are new to family history, don't feel overwhelmed. I know it sometimes feels a little bit like you're taking a drink from a fire hose. One of the beautiful things about family history research in general is that you can just take it at your own pace. You can make discoveries as, you, as your skills and knowledge level allows you to do that. And then when you're ready to take it to the next level, there are classes, there are webinars, there are genealogical conferences, there are super helpful people in Facebook groups and chat rooms uh, and genealogical societies that allow you to make new discoveries as you're ready to do that. So uh, you know, if this is a little bit overwhelming, don't get discouraged. For those of you who've been doing family history for a long time, um, wills and probate records and records that are, you know, earlier than 1800 require a little bit of a different skill set. And so kudos to you for taking the opportunity to familiarize yourself with that and become uh, a little bit more proficient in that. Okay, I have two more quick collections that I want to highlight. One is the Nova Scotia Canada Book of Negroes from 1783. And one of the reasons I want to highlight this is because um, there are not a lot of records for blacks. And so when there are records available, I want to make sure that we call those out so that um, it's understood that it is possible to trace black history in America. 
Um, we get that a lot from people who think that they can't. Now, this is um, Canada. Canada, of course, being part of North America. Uh, but this particular book I find uh, especially fascinating. So essentially what it is, is it's a list of several thousand um, blacks who, following the American Revolution, got on a ship and went up to Canada so that they could enjoy their freedom. And so we have this detailed list and it's searchable by name and birth date. Um, and it's a really, really great resource that's available. If you scroll down here again, you're going to see just a brief database description that's going to give you that information. And this is one of those situations where um, also you have records that are unexpected. So you have records that, um, you know, maybe you thought your family was always from Michigan, but really your family were free blacks who made their way up to Canada, spent a generation or two in Canada, and then came to Michigan. Um, and that it may be a path that you hadn't considered or a, sto a family story that hadn't been passed down. And so be willing to think a little bit outside of the box. Be willing to consider that what you have are always conceived or perceived as the family story may be a little bit different than what you thought. The other thing that I want to point out with this particular database is something that's a little bit sensitive to some people, and that's the title of this database. So this database you can see here is entitled The Book of Negroes, and that's a word that some of you may find offensive. But there are a couple of things when it comes to genealogy that we all need to wrap our heads around. First of all, the, this is actually the name of the book from the Nova Scotian archives from 1783. And so Ancestry has chosen not to change the title of the book. That's the name of the book. Second of all, you will come across, and this is true for blacks, this is true for whites, this is true for anybody from any race or culture, there are terms that were used historically that now uh, are considered offensive. But when we are looking through historical records, it's important to understand that we are looking at records that were that were created in a time and place with different sensibilities. And so we need to be careful not to be offended or not to decide these are not our people because they're labeled differently than we would expect or than the, what we would like. Um, I only bring that up because I've seen that and I wanna make sure that we all understand that um, you will see um, historical terms used. And that's, I mean, I'm not just talking about racial terms. Um, for example, in the Carolinas, there are records called bastardy bonds. And that's a particular word that some people find very offensive, but that's the name of the records. They are, in fact, records of children who were born out of wedlock and information that the mothers of those children were giving uh, in order to secure money from the fathers in some cases, or the fathers trying to, you know, prove they weren't the father, whatever the case may be, right? So you have these bastardy bonds, and that's the name of the record. So it's not just a racial thing. Um, there are terms that have been used throughout history. Uh, illegitimate is one that comes to mind. I've seen that written in the margins of parish registers um, that we might uh, choose not to use today in referencing some of those ancestors but that are on the records and we need to recognize them in the historical context that we are researching. Okay, last collection I wanna talk about um, is from Estonia. Um, so Estonia census tax and house lists from 1784 to 1944. Estonia is one of those countries that gets um, not a lot of love, um, but one of the things I wanted to point out, the reason why I highlighted this collection is over here you'll see this record count is listed as zero. And when you click through to view this particular database, you might hit refresh a couple of times because you think the page isn't fully loading. Because what you'll notice is missing is the search box. Well, that's because these particular records, which come from the National Archives of Estonia, have not yet been indexed on Ancestry. And Ancestry has quite a few collections like this that will never come up in a search because they have not yet been indexed. And it's important to understand why using the card catalog is so important uh, is because it will help you locate these kinds of records. So if your family lived in Estonia or Italy or New Mexico or wherever the case may be, there, 
do a search in the card catalog for that location and you might discover gems like this one that are going to allow you to access records uh, without having to wait for them to be indexed. So the fastest, easiest way to understand how to use these records is to just look over here at this browse box. Anytime a collection is not indexed, there will be a browse box. You can then browse by location, so in this case, a specific location in Estonia, and then you can browse by the type of record that you're looking for, and you'll see here an, um, an alphabet breakout, and then you can pull up a specific year. That will take you to a set of images that, again, just like a reel of microfilm, you can quickly browse, quickly scroll through these to jump to a place. Right? I do that if I can figure out that they're organized alphabetically or if they're organized chronologically, and I know I'm looking for something specific, I can just use this film strip to quickly jump. I can then minimize the film strip, size the image here, and then I can go image by image through these particular records. Again, just like I would a reel of microfilm in the family history library looking for details about my family history. So that is uh, the Estonia records. And again, like many records on Ancestry, they are not yet indexed. And if you don't want to wait for them to be indexed, then you can browse them to your heart's content. Uh, I have found some real, real gems or real gold in those particular records. Well, that is all I have for you today. Hopefully this was useful. If you have any questions about what we've talked about today, feel free to leave a comment here on the YouTube channel. I will respond to those as I am able. And if you have specific suggestions for topics you would like discussed in future episodes of The Barefoot Genealogist, you can email me at ask at ancestry.com with those suggestions. Just put a little something in the subject line with my name or suggestions for videos or something so that it catches my eye. Um, and then uh, every week I will update the Facebook page, the Ancestry Facebook page, with the topic for the week. Or you can just subscribe to the YouTube channel here and then you will get an email notification every time we upload a new video. Well, until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.